So we heard how wonderful your presentation was, uh, revealing the secrets and intricacies of the applicant tracking system. She has oh, 20 years, <laughs> over 20 years of experience in the HR field. Uh, most recently, she was uh, the director, I believe, of Human Resources with the YMCA of uh, Greater Williamson County. And before that, she was with uh, the YMCA program in Houston. Uh, the greater Houston area. She has been uh, a director of employee relations. She has been in the HR world in various capacities for a very, very, very long time. She is definitely a subject matter expert in this field. And uh, let me not waste any more time and introduce you to Linda Alleman. Well, I'm happy to be here. and. Um, like you, I've been a job seeker a number of times, and I know it's critical to make sure that you've got all the components there, the skills, the experience, and the resume. And so we're not going to talk about the, the actual resume uh, format itself so much. I'm sure you've, you've had it tweaked by different people, and you've gone through, and you've got all your different categories. But what we want to do is make sure that you optimize your resume for the applicant tracking system. And I don't know if anybody's talked to you about that before. Does everybody know what an applicant tracking system is? We're going to talk about that. That's when you submit your resume through that magical little system and it goes into somewhere and something happens to it. And we're going to talk a little bit about what happens to it. Um, and if, you're, if, you're, if you've been doing that process, you may have gotten frustrated over the course of time because you don't hear back or you think it's gone into Never Never Land and quite honestly it may have gone into Never Never Land, that black hole, because of some of the things you might be doing or might not be doing with your resume. And so hopefully we can touch on a few things, bless you, we can touch on a few things that might give you a greater chance of your resume making it through the uh, computer process so that it can get into the hands of a human being, which is the goal in the first place. Because if it doesn't make it to the human being, you'll never make it to an uh, interview, which is the whole point of getting your resume through the process. So what we need to do is get your resume to speak ATS. So what is an ATS? It's an applicant tracking system, and that's what it is, is a software management system that is going to, uh, it's designed to help the organization recruit and screen applicants more effectively. Now why does one do that? Why does one use that? There are a lot of reasons. When I've worked at different organizations, um, I've worked at small enough organizations, the YMCA of Greater Winston County has grown and expanded uh, exponentially from the course of the time that I worked there um, to, to now. I've been gone for a few years. Um, but while I was there, we actually didn't have an applicant tracking system other than the human process. So when the resumes came through and we would post a job, we could literally get 100 or 200 resumes for one position. That means that a human being has to sit there and look at each of those individually. We don't have time to do that during the course of the day. I would take resumes home and sit in front of the TV and go through resumes one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Can you imagine Dell doing that? When Dell gets thousands of applicants, they don't have time for that. They can't do that. It's not, it just doesn't make any sense. So here's what happens. The system receives your resume, along with hundreds of others, and maybe even thousands of others. Your resume is going to be run through what's called a parser. And the parser is a program that removes different things. It, it uh, removes the styling and the breaks that are in your, in your uh, formatting. It um, breaks it down. To, uh, the text into recognized strings of characters, and it's going to further analyze it. So you may not be aware of that, but when it goes through, you've, you've spent all this time making this beautiful, gorgeous resume that some of you may have even paid somebody to prepare for you. So let me warn you right there, there's no reason to pay anybody ever to prepare your resume. There are folks at the job clubs, there are folks at the workforce solutions offices who will help you prepare a gorgeous, wonderful resume. Do not pay anybody. I, I met someone who had paid someone hundreds of dollars to prepare a resume and she handed it to me and she said, look at this. And honestly, I didn't know what to say to her because it was the most awful looking thing I had ever seen. And had she handed it to me as an actual applicant, I would have tossed it. I wouldn't have given it a second look. I didn't even read the whole thing because it was so convoluted. All of the white space was filled out. It had all sorts of bizarre jumble in it, and it was meant to be a creative resume, and she wasn't applying for a creative position. So 
You don't need to pay anybody for a resume. But what happens when it goes into these systems is all of that is broken down and it's put into data. It's not, it doesn't go in as that pretty resume. So be aware of that. Also, from all the information that I've done research on, personally and on the internet, and you can Google, how can I get through an HVS system? How can I get my resume through an applicant tracking system? You know, what should I do? Approximately 75% of resumes don't go through. They just don't make it through for whatever reason. It could be you don't have the skills or the experience, or you just did something wrong. So the odds are that you're, you're not going to make it through in the first place. So what you need to do is work really hard to get your resume set up to speak ATS so that it can get through. Because if it's not formatted correctly, right there, you've already lost the game. It's just not going to go through. The, the system is looking for a particular format, and in that format, it's going to put certain data in certain fields. If you're not formatted correctly, your data is going to either go in the wrong field or it's just going to be missed completely. Then you've got a problem because it's not going to look right for the um, recruiters that are looking for it. All right, so what is an ATS? Again, the parser assigns meaning to the content. It sorts it into different categories. These are the main categories. Contact information, work experience, skills, and education. Those are the main categories. The system scans your resume, and it looks for contextual keywords, phrases, and then it's going to mathematically score you and it's going to add in the amount of uh, years of experience you have to that score. The score is going to be from 0 to 100. And then the top individuals, the highest scores, are going to be considered the most qualified. And only those are the ones that are going to get sent through. Only those with the highest score are the ones that actually get passed on to the human, either the recruiter or if it's a company that doesn't have a recruiter. Only those with the highest score get passed on. The rest of them? Don't get looked at. Not going to happen. All right. Are we able to ask you questions? Absolutely. Does it matter? Um, I've heard uh, that the titles can sometimes make a, uh, a difference if sometimes if people say employment instead of work experience. Yeah, actually, I've got that on here. Oh, okay. The titles do make a difference. Okay. Thank and you. certain programs, and I'll talk about that. Taleo, for example, Taleo is the biggest program out there. Taleo is very picky about titles. And Taleo is looking for things in a very particular order, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did, did you have a question? Okay. Yes. So when you say it also combines with years of service, I, I wonder about that sometimes, though, because sometimes years of service can be a ding against you if you had too many. Is that true? Or? It can if you're applying for more of an entry-level, lower, lower job, and you put down that you've got 35 years or something, then yes, that would be a ding against you. It can be. It depends on what the company has put in for criteria. Because they set the criteria. They set up and say, this is what I'm looking for. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So why, is, why use an ATS? Why does the company use it? I'm sorry. No problem. Um, so I was actually applying for a job recently that was using Paleo. Um, and asked me to upload my resume. And then it asked me to fill out an application which takes my resume and puts it into the predefined box. I have yet to have applied in, in the past where it has not done that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some, but most of the jobs that I've applied have not. So how important is the formatting or the titling or any of the other components that you're mentioning here, not the keywords, I, I respect that, but for the definition, where I, where I as a human have to format it the way they tell me to, even though they take my initial resume content I think it's still very important because it's still going into the ATS system it, as well. It's still looking for a particular set of format. But you need to make sure that when it pulls that, that data over that it's pulling it over correctly as well. So I still think you want to have the format in the way that we're talking about here because Taleo typically looks for a particular format. So if it doesn't populate those application fields correctly, is that a sign that yes. you should reformat? I, I would think so, so yeah. Yeah, it's, it, because it is, it is pulling and it is looking for very specific fields and it's typically the four fields that I named. And if it isn't finding it in that order, then it's, it's, its search is not being successful. Does that make sense? Can we show you its results so you can check the work? 
to some degree, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Taleo, T-A-L-E-O, I believe. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, so people use ATS systems to post job openings to a website or job board, to screen resumes, run automated resume tracking, I'm sorry, ranking, track individual applicants, they know, you know, when you come back to a site, they know that you're there and you can, you can continue to track yourself through a site. Like if you weren't successful, you can leave your resume in there and um, they'll say, hey, a job has come up. We see that you were looking in our, uh, you know, for jobs at whatever company. We have something you think you'd be interested in. It, it tracks you as well. Um, provide customized input forms. Provide customized pre-screen questions. You've got the ones where it says, do you have at least this? Yes or no. Um, track the applicant's responses, and they can in, uh, generate interview requests via email. They can do all sorts of things with those systems and more. And the systems today are so much smarter than a few years ago. And there's actually been some talk, some of the job boards from HR recruiters, that the systems have gotten too smart and they ask too many questions. How many times have you bailed out filling out the online information and you've said, oh my God, you're just, you might as well just take my first kid. This is just too much. I have, I've, I've given them. I'm not currently looking for a position. Um, I, I still go to the job clubs and I speak regularly at the Higher Texas Job Club, club. I'm one of their speakers. But I'm not currently looking because my, my current job is helping take care of my 91 year old mother-in-law who's moved in with us here at Parkinson's. So I've kind of, I do taxes in the off season and I help with job clubs and I help, you know, talk about what's going on in the, the work world. To, to help folks, but I'm not actively seeking anymore because it, it just is too much. I have to be there for, for her. But I know when I was looking, there were certain ones I'd get, you know, two thirds of the way full and go, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm done. I don't need to answer all these questions. You, you know, I went through, I'm a certified um, senior professional in human resources. There, it, there's an exam that you take that you study for, for months and months and months, and then you take this four hour exam. I had one application that I had to take this hour exam that was almost as grueling as the, the SPHR exam just to get the application through. Some of that's just ridiculous. And there's some talk that they're, they're asking for too much these days. But we'll see what happens. But it is estimated that over half of mid-sized companies, mid companies and over 90% of large companies all use some form of the system. So because it's out there, you have to work with it. You have no choice. It's there, so you've got to deal with it. When a candidate doesn't make it through the ATS system, basically you're just out of the running. Your resume literally goes into some black hole. It's gone and it's not coming back. You know, you sit there and go, well, maybe they'll call me later. If you did something wrong and it falls off, chances are it's not coming back. Question. Yes. The system smart enough to know if that candidate resubmits? Um, that's a good question. I have heard both yes and no. So I'm going to be honest, I don't know for sure. But I've heard yes and I've heard no. You're going to be in their database, but as far as resubmitting for the exact same job, I don't know if you would have a problem or not. Yes? I have encountered that in some cases. <laughs> resume I loaded was like two years old. Yes. And they still retained it. I was going to say, I did have a friend, that's a very good point. He said that he, that there was once where he reapplied and they retained a, a, a resume. I couldn't update. I, I was going to say, now that you say that, I have a friend who reapplied for a position and it was about two years later. And it says, thank you, but we already have your resume on file. And she was not able to submit a more recent resume or application as well. So there are some glitches in the system. That's a very good point. And I don't know how you get around that. I, I don't know how you get around that. All right, so how does an ATS rank a resume's re relevance? They give points for matches of keywords and terms in the job postings on your resume. And I think you've all heard about keywords. So you all know that you want to use certain keywords, and there's lots of ways to find those keywords. What matters to the system is the rarity or the uniqueness of the keywords or the term that's specific to that particular job posting. And what it is is the, the ATS system is looking at all the job postings that are in the system, and they're matching them to this particular job posting and the keywords that go to that job posting. Sometimes, sometimes the systems are set to scan only the first page of a resume. Now, not everyone does that, but some of them do. 
So be aware of that, that you want to make sure your first page, and you've probably heard you should fold your resume in half, and the most important information should be on that top half or top third of your resume, because if a human is scanning it, that's what they're looking for, the very top part. Um, so if somebody has set their scanner to just scan the front page, you want to make sure you've got some really good info on that front page. All right, when an ATS ranks a candidate as a good match, the recruiter doesn't see the actual resume. I mentioned that. They just see the data. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. The recruiter sees a database of information on the candidate, and we've talked about this. If the resume is formatted, formatted incorrectly, the information is going to be loaded into the wrong databases, and fields may be missed completely or just put in the wrong place. And I know, as somebody had mentioned before, sometimes it, it takes your, your information and it loads it into an application for you, and then you can see how it does that. So if you see that it's loaded it into an application for the company, and it's got your address in the name line, or it's got um, data for the job titles in the uh, date location, then you know it definitely loaded it incorrectly and you've got a problem. Okay? So let's talk about what you can do to help get through this system on your resume. So here's some tips. One tip is never, ever submit your resume as a PDF unless you have checked ahead of time that the system can do it, can accept a PDF. And I've heard lots of people tell me why I always submit my resume as a PDF because I don't want anybody messing with it. I've got the format set and it looks beautiful and I don't want anybody to mess with it. Many, many, many of the, uh, the ATS systems cannot take PDFs. So unless you know, unless you can read that a PDF is acceptable, do not send it in that way. The safest way to submit it is as a text document. A Word file can also mess up with the parsings. So unless you know it can accept it and it won't be messed up, send it as a text document. Text is absolutely the safest. Do not include tables and graphics. People like to do that and they get messed up. It is okay to submit a longer resume. The interesting thing about an ATS system is it doesn't care how long your resume is. It could be five pages. I wouldn't recommend five pages. But it can be that long. You can put in more um, keywords. It doesn't matter. The, it's going to go on. One, one note, for those of us that are a little bit older, we were taught in typing to put two periods. I'm sorry, two spaces after a period. That's out. And you should have already heard that when you do your resume. But if you have it in there, the system is going to be going along. It sees a period and it sees a space. It's going to look for some more information after that one space. If you have two spaces, it's going to stop. It thinks you're done. It's going to go down and look for the next paragraph. So if you put two periods and then go on to another sentence, it's not going to get that next sentence. So that'll mess up the ATS system. So be aware of that. You'll lose any data after those two spaces if you put two spaces after your period. So for the younger folks that see that, it'll aid you. For the computer, it'll mess you up. Does that make sense? If you said hypothetically you could three or four pages on the new scan, but if it's only looking at the top half or the first page, certain amount of the viewers can do the match. That's what is it doing the only some just scan that far. If somebody has set it to just scan the first one, not most don't do that, but every now and then you'll get a recruiter that just says, since I only look at the front, since I only look at that first, I'm just going to set it to do that. Most don't, but you'll get an occasional one that does. So it's just a reminder to make sure that the first part of your resume is done really well with that key information, your qualifications, your some, uh, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, accomplishments. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, the period spacing thing is in just about age. Um, for some of us, the way our style manuals are for writing in our fields, we're still using two periods. So that's good to know. Yeah. Two spaces. Yeah. Two spaces. Yeah. I can say, yeah. Two spaces. Okay. That is good to know. But it it will mess up the in the program. Um, but a, a, a younger person often equates that with an, someone who was taught, who's older, so they were taught to two spaces. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Say it again. Um, can you just put experience, or does it have to say work experience? Taleo 
in particular, prefers the words work experience. So can there be a word in front of work experience, like relevant work experience? No, because what, why would you put irrelevant work experience? Yeah. Old, I'm just talking about old, career, old jobs. You're not good. You wouldn't put old jobs on there if they're not if they're irrelevant. You you only want relevant work experience on your resume. So Taleo in particular looks for work experience. Most of them look for the words work experience. I had professional experience on mine, and read this and thought, oh, that's interesting. And I've read it in more than one place. So if somebody knows something different, feel free to jump in. If you work with the system and you know that it's fine, please feel free to jump in. But this is everything that I've come across. And so I'm trying to arm you with the, the most up-to-date current information that I've personally come across. And I've heard work experience, and that is, as I've gone through these articles, every time I've come up with it, it says, make it simple, work experience, that's what it's looking for. And then you always list your work experience with the employer's name first, followed by the title of your job, and then the dates that you held it. And often people mix that up, so you, you always want to have it in that order the name of the employer, job title, and dates. Not your dates first, and then the employer, and then you always want it in that order, because that is the order that it wants to propagate it. That's, yes. So you should not, for example, put two of those, and then the date tabs over, and the dates on the far other No, the, the date can be on the far right. That's <laughs> where it's looking for it. But you want to make sure that you have the employer's name first, then the job title, then the date. Um, yes? Sometimes when somebody has had multiple job titles with <coughs> the same company, mm -hmm. we've told them to put the company name first and then, and then the job titles underneath that. Uh, but for this, they'd have to do each one as a separate uh, ent entry? Well, I think if they do the, the employer's name, title, date, title, date, that would be okay. That would probably be okay. Okay. Thank but you. don't do employer right. name, date, and then title. Because if you do them in the opposite right. order, right. it's going right. to confuse right. things. Yeah. Yes? So what do you put down for your employer if you've been a contract employee that you've worked at a large corporation? Do you put down both? <coughs> or do you want to put A and B, contractor both? Or how does that work? Well, if you've, done, if you've been a contractor and you've worked there for a very long time, you could still put that employer and then put in parentheses contract employee. And that way you've got the name of that employer there. And then you can just explain in parentheses contract employee. I think that's acceptable. What do you think about that? What I usually do is tell people to put like IBM through CTI or something like that. Yeah. So then you've got... They understand if they check your references at IBM, they won't have anything on you. They have to check your references. Yeah, your and name the co company. That's, yeah, that works <laughs> perfectly. Yes. And what if you've done more contract or freelancing? In other words, you've got several clients. I mean, and none of them take priority. I mean, none, none then you would, them. then you're just going to have to go with freelance and, and, and then just list them out and the dates. You're, there, this is not going to fit everything perfectly. It, you, you're just going to have to list that you're a freelancer or you're self-employed or put the, you know, yourself as the company name and then list the companies underneath and the dates and just list them down. And what about using the title communications consultant? I think that's fine. I think that's fine. I don't have any problem with that, yeah. yeah. I think that's fine. The one problem you have is if you confound, and I use that word loosely, the robots, they just dump resumes. If you confuse them, what they do is they just dump the resume. They don't keep it. They don't keep going with it and try to figure it out. They're, they're, they're set up to just dump a resume if it's difficult. If they can't figure it out, your resume goes into that black hole. And you're one of those 75% or greater that just doesn't get passed on. Yes. And underneath that, if you had an introductory paragraph saying provided such and such services for enlist, let's say, six, and, and would it be better in the accomplishments in your bullets, for example, to say what you did for that company and not even list the, to give them an idea of the companies you worked for? 
you see what I'm saying? Because you're not going to list them all with what you did for them, but you're just going, so how, how are you? Well, the recommendation actually is under each company to list what you did because that's what the ATS is looking for. The ATS is actually looking for an accomplishment and descriptions under each company name. The, that's what the ATS is actually going to look for. It's going to look for a little something under each company name and date. That's just the way it's set up. ATSs require simplicity and conformity. All right, so you need to delete all those extra touches, the shading, the logos, the pictures. They can't, they can't scan the, the um, they can't t uh, contextualize the, the logos and the pictures. It's not searchable in the database for them. So no logos, no pictures, no shadings, no script. They don't like script. Um, no headers and footers. As much as we like to put those in there, those are not good. So wait a minute. It just wants free-flowing text. I understand, though, that on resumes, they want you to put a continuation at the top of each page, so you don't do that on this? Not, not inserted as a header. You can put it at the top and then go down a couple of lines, but you don't, you know how you use an actual header? Yeah. You don't use the header format because it doesn't like header formats. How, how old is this technology? <laughs> it's been around for a long time and it's being updated, but it just doesn't, yeah. this system doesn't like it. Yeah. yeah. These are just, uh, these are just hints to tell you things that can, bless you, knock your resume out. I'm just telling you, these are set up for, Basic, basic text. Yes. Um, so what I've seen um, is, so I'm wondering if this still applies because I've seen where you have to enter these into individual fields, then you have to type a for resume, then you have to upload your resume. So if I've already entered this in the fields, I still need to format this in this way when I upload, when I copy and paste it into their screen. Well, if you're putting your resume in, you should have your resume set up in this basic format. Right, right. But I, what I meant is, um, do you think that it might still apply if, so you're telling me, for example, always listen to work experience with your employer's name first, followed by your job, yes. then, followed by the case. Yes. So they've already asked me to enter this in individual fields, mm -hmm. and then after I've done that, then I still have to type and take my resume. So what you're saying is, even though I've already entered this it should still be in the format they're looking for, yes. And back to the headers. Headers and footers actually jam up the al al algorithm if you use an actual header and footer. That's the problem. Yeah. Yes? So um, I've filled out a couple of applications. I'm sort of new. And I've just, I guess from laziness, I just said import from LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So is that, I shouldn't be doing that. I should just import directly from my resume instead I, of LinkedIn? You have a better chance if you do. Okay. Because in LinkedIn, I notice it just kind of, because I have so much stuff in there. That's why, because it doesn't know where to pull it. Because okay. your LinkedIn isn't set up as an actual resume. Your LinkedIn is set up as a summary of your job experience. And but it's it, got... It doesn't take any precedence over whether you do LinkedIn or a, or a document. If you're applying through LinkedIn, LinkedIn has different, you know, formatting information, but if, it, if you're just going through the, the employer's website, it, it will say you want to go through LinkedIn, and it may be set up to take it that way, but just be aware your better chances are, are to do an actual one that matches the formatting. If it's going through Kaleo, for example, or one of the other big ones, your, your chances are better if you format it the way they're looking for it. Let me get Kim, and then I'll go back to you. Yes? So I'm getting the sense that really what you should have is two resumes, one that's designed for humans when, you know, Joe says, send me your resume, uh, when Joe's a hiring manager or Joe's somebody that you know at a company and he wants to literally forward that the email. And then another resume with the same content but formatted specifically for ATS so that you can have your ATS styled resume and your human readable resume. Is that sort of what I'm trying to do? Sort of, except on the end, if yours makes it through the ATS, it'll eventually get printed out and you still want it to look somewhat proper for a human. So you, I know that sounds odd. Well, yeah, because doing that with a plain text format is that's hard to do. <laughs> I'm just telling you what they're saying. I know, I know, I know. Yes? Uh, 
What do you mean by shadings? Are you saying you shouldn't have any bold italics, underlines, that kind of thing? Um, I think bold is fine, but when you, some people sh actually shade sections of the resume. I've seen some bizarre resumes where people actually shade sections for emphasis. So don't, no shadings, no, no italics. Um, people do very unique things to try to make their resume stand out. And, and if you're doing it one that you know is going directly to a human, you know, say I, I know someone who knows someone and is going to get my resume directly given to that person, that's one thing. But if you know it's going through the ATS, take all that stuff out. Do not do, not do that. People put borders around them, do different, different things that doesn't like borders. They don't, that messes up the, the system. It just can't but handle like it. The bold is okay. I think bold is fine. And bullets are fine. Bullets, bullets are fine. It can handle that. Yes. And when you say no italics, so if you're naming a publication, um, are you saying put it, always put it in quotes, don't italicize it? The ATS does not like italics. I know when you name a publication, you're supposed to italicize it, but the, the ATS does not like italics. Yes. So it sounds to me like uh, along the lines of the two resumes that this is actually more of a CV than a resume because if you're listing everything, like I, I, I work for a company where I've, I've been there 16 years and I have, I've had seven different roles and if I listed, a lot of what I do is very similar so I list it all underneath because otherwise my resume would be really long. But you have to remember your resume isn't just listing what you do, it's what you've accomplished. Well and accomplishments too but a lot of that stuff is very similar yeah. and, and so my resume would be very long if I, you know, because they're similar roles. So I'm just, it, it seems to me that this is more of a CV format and because it's very simple mm -hmm. versus the human resume, which is supposed to be, we're marketing ourselves to a human. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I suppose you could say that. Yeah, because over two pages, it would go over two pages if I did it. And it can. Yeah. It can, because the, the computer's not going to complain if it goes over two pages. But a human way. Not necessarily. It depends on your years of service and it depends on if it's relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you only include the typical resume section such as qualifications, work experience, skills, and education. That's basically what you're looking for. Sometimes people like to add other things, um, other categories. They like to add um, things that just don't seem to be relevant for the computer, you know, civic organizations, um, publications. And they may be relevant to you for what you're applying, but basically, and I'll go back to Taleo again, education is usually listed last, and after education, Taleo doesn't know what to look for. It, it's, it's pretty much done after you list your education. It doesn't look for anything else. So it gets confused if it sees things after that. Do you usually have anything that says summary? Summaries are usually at the top. So, like a qualification summary. You don't put a summary at the bottom. So, oh, so if you say qualifications summary. You would have that at the very beginning. Sure. No, not if it's at the beginning. But if you put something after education, from what I'm hearing, it gets confused. Education, from what I'm hearing, should be the last thing on there. And if you've heard something different, Kathy? No, I think his, I think his question was, instead of qualifications at the top, if lots of people have the word summary. Com yeah, if it's at the beginning, I think you're fine. Qualification the summary is there. Is that going to kick No, I think qualification summary at the beginning is fine, but not nothing at the end after. Right. If it does not include the word qualifications and it just says summary. I haven't heard that that would kick it out at the very beginning. I think it's probably okay. And what about a section like awards? No. 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 You can put those awards in your um, in your bullets. bullets. Yeah. Exactly, that's a great answer. You put it in the experience. Yes. Well, so a similar question. I've got a bunch of patents. Where should I get reward? I would put them where, where they were issued, you know, what, when working for blah, blah, blah. It, it doesn't always work that way, though. The corporate patents are not necessarily directly tied to what you worked on. I'm sorry, say it again? Corporate patents are not necessarily always tied to exactly a specific work assignment. To a specific? To a specific work assignment. But they're to a specific company. Received this patent while working for IBM. Because you wouldn't patent one cross over companies, would it? No, but often you, a lot of people talk about they have, I, I understand what you guys are talking about. You have several jobs at the same company, you talk about different roles over the years, you've got patents or awards related to specifically the company. They're right. Not necessarily related to the specific job. Then you might put it as one of your achievements at the beginning of that company. 
um, was awarded this patent while working there. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, so use a job posting or description to find the listed verbs, phrases, verb phrases, keywords, and skills to include in your resume, and you want to mirror some of that wording. Now you don't want to copy it identically, but you want to mirror some of it that you know might be the kind of speak that they use at that particular company, and then you don't want to you don't want to um, use it so often that it's very obvious that you're just jamming it into the resume because the um, computers are set to look for. If you used it over and over and over and over and over, um, then it will know that you're just putting it in there just to put it in there. It needs to make sense where you have it, but you need to have it enough that it makes sense that it's there as well and it stands out that you do have XYZ experience or whatever you know it is. And then try using programs like Wordle and Tag Crowd to help find those keywords. Have you, have you all used those? You know what those are? Um, there are programs where you can take, for example, um, you could take three or four job descriptions, say HR manager, HR director, copy all those words, go to wordle.net, www.wordle.net is actually what it is, and copy those in and then say go, and you'll come up with something like this. And it, the bigger the word is that shows up, that shows the predominance of that word being used in the job description that you've put in there. So in this one, for example, the word employee was in there a lot, the word human was in there a lot, resources were in there a lot, and it arranges it. And you can tell it to rearrange it in a different order, you can tell it to put it in different colors for you, just make it look pretty. Um, but it, sh it shows the relevance of the word by how big the word shows up. And you can do it with anything. You can, you can take paragraphs from books, you can take anything you want and put it into Wordle or um, tag, uh, tag Crowd. And it'll do that for you. It's really a great program. And it just gives you the predominance of, of uh, the set of words. It tells you how predominant it is. So you can copy down. I copied four different job postings for human resource manager, and that's what I came up with that. That's from Wordle. Yes? So are abbreviations fine to use? Like, well, do you want to actually spell out the word? That's on here as well. Uh, we'll come up to that in just a second. Good question. Um, I did come across, just as a side note, when we talk about putting information in here, one, when I was Googling, one thing did say that they want you to put in your personal postal address, and it said that some of the ATS systems will kick your resume out if you don't put that in. Now, when I teach people resumes, I tell them not to put in their personal address these days because your resumes get uploaded on the, you know, Monster and Career and wherever else and people don't need your personal address, that when you go and actually meet with someone and fill out an application, that's when they can get your personal address. All you need to say is you're in Austin, Texas, or you're in Round Rock, or wherever you want to put. But this particular, and I only saw it one time, said that some of the programs are set up to kick you out if you don't put a postal address. So I don't know if that's true or not, to be honest. I don't know if anybody's come across that. I find it hard to believe that they would kick you out if you didn't put the street address versus if you put the city. Yes? I think it depends on the field. Certain fields um, are okay to leave blank. I'm just telling you that you have to be aware when you fill out all the information, when it populates, it may not populate it correctly and you want to make sure that it doesn't leave something blank that shouldn't be left blank. So if you've populated it, if you've filled your resume out in a manner that it doesn't transfer over to a resume correctly, or to an application correctly, and you notice that it has, has not filled in your job experience correctly or your um, phone number or whatever didn't fill into the proper field, then, then you've got a problem. You want to make sure that it doesn't leave fields blank that should, should not be left blank. And what I mean, um, let me see. So, you know, a lot of times when you're filling something out, if it's required and you don't fill it out, it will say you can't continue. Correct. But our ATS has been set up to let you continue even though you left the field blank. It'll still kick you. If it's a required field and you didn't fill it out, it will not continue if you didn't fill it out. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, career objective sections are now antiquated, considered a waste of space and time. So 
You replace the career objective section with a qualification summary or qualification summary, and that's four to six sentences or bullet points. Bullet points are perfectly fine. The ATS can handle that. Um, so uh, ATS friendly keywords, major skills and achievements. So one thing you've got to remember when you're doing this is to check, check, and recheck for spelling errors. And I go over this as an HR person. I would say easily one third to one half. And it's of the resumes that I've read, because I, as I said at the Y, I read them. In a study that I just saw said 58% approximately of um, resumes that were surveyed by recruiters and, and HR people, 58% had spelling errors in them. And the individual said they would zap a resume just for a spelling error. Again, the, the ATS system doesn't like spelling errors. So unlike a human, an ATS will terminate your resume because it has no idea what you're talking about with misspelled words. So something as simple as a misspelled word. And I'll give you an example of how I pride myself on doing things correctly. Um, when I was in Houston, I, um, I had worked for Six Flags Astroworld for uh, almost 25 years. I grew up there from a summer job that I never left from. And um, that job went away. The company was taken over by somebody else. I oversaw layoffs um, from our staff, three, three layoffs in nine months, and then it was my time. My, my job went away. I was the VP of HR. And uh, after my job went away, it was time to look for a new job. So one of the places that I applied um, at, for a job was the director of HR at Fleur, which is a big company in Houston. Well, I did my resume. I was very proud of it, thought it was great. I thought, let me do one more spell check before I send this puppy in the mail, because this was a while ago, we had to mail these things. And uh, spell checked it, spell check came out OK, saved it, stuck it in the envelope, mailed it. So I had printed a copy to save, and I stuck it in my file with the other ones I had sent off. Well, guess what spell check did? It, it sure did. Do you think the people at Fleur are going to hire somebody that called their company Flower? <laughs> no. So you have to check, check, and recheck. And do not let those little things happen to you. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Do you know how embarrassing that is? I, I, you know, if I was really a brave person, which I'm not, I would have called them and said, let me tell you what happened. But I'm still a really great HR person. I, you know, I just slunk down and went, oh, you're just an idiot. So don't let those things happen. We cannot often check our own work as well as somebody else can check it for us. Because we know what we think it's supposed to say. That doesn't mean it says it. So have somebody else check it for you. Because often there are things on there that we don't realize it says. Um, a misspelled word. We use the word, you know, here, H-E-R-E, -E, instead of H-E-A-R. Those, you know, those sorts of things. We just, we know what we think it's supposed to say, and it doesn't say it. So use sans serif fonts, like Verdana or Tahoma, instead of, and 11 or 12 points instead of Times New Roman and um, Cambria, which are serif fonts. And um, don't use script fonts. So don't use Times New Roman, Cambria, or script fonts. The system doesn't like those either. Um, Calibri and Arial, those are OK to use. But the preferred ones that work the best in the systems are the Verdana and Tahoma. All right, so this was a question that was asked earlier. Use both the spelled out form of an acronym and the um, spelled out form and the acronym, I'm sorry, of any given title, certificate, or organization. For example, certified public accountant, CPA, project management professional, PMP, or electronic medical records, EMR. Because you don't know which one the program has been set up to actually scan for. You don't know the person that set up the criteria may have just put in the EMR for electronic medical records. Or they may have put in the whole word. So put both in. So when I put my title on something, I put both Senior Professional and Human Resources and SPHR, because I don't know which one they're scanning for. Don't embellish your skills or your experience on the resume in order to get through the ATS, thinking, oh, I, I, I need to get through. I need to put all this stuff in there. Because if you do get through to that human for the interview, then you have to live up to everything that you put in there. And sometimes people happen. And embellished resumes 
happen all the time. People embellish school, they embellish skills and experience, they embellish all sorts of things. And the one thing that will get you knocked out, if the ATS didn't do it faster than anything else, is not being truthful on a resume. I'm not gonna hire somebody that isn't truthful. Because if you're not truthful there, what else are you not truthful on? It happens all the time. I'd much rather hire somebody who doesn't have as much, many skills, because I can teach you those, we can teach you those. What I'm looking for is a cultural fit. And when you come into an interview, just as a side note, I'm not worried about getting you a job. I'm not worried about hiring you and getting you off the unemployment ranks. I'm worried about solving my problem. I've got an opening. It's probably been open for a while if I've got it posted out there on, you know, Monster and every, everywhere else. I'm worried about getting that filled as quickly as possible with the best fit. I don't need to hire another problem person. How many people have worked in companies that had lots of problem people? I don't need another problem person. I need somebody who's going to come in and solve my problems, not create a problem. So I will take somebody that's going to be a great cultural fit, but doesn't have as much experience any day over somebody who's got an amazing set of credentials, but who comes in and who's arrogant, who's rude, who I can see is going to be a problem right in the beginning. I'll pass that person over any day for somebody who just needs a little bit of training, for sure. So don't embellish your resume just to try to get through the ATS. Be truthful, be honest, be yourself. Because it's hard to be somebody else all the time if you're just making stuff up. You can't do it. You've got to be yourself. All right, don't try to game the system. Has anybody heard of people trying to put in white words? Where you, you put in words that you can't see, but the ATS can see them? Don't do it. The systems have been modernized, and they know to look for those words. And they consider that cheating. And you'll get bumped out for that, too. So don't, don't do that. And the recruiters know about it, and they'll just go, you know, we don't need that. We don't need that mess. And what it is is you, you put the words in, and then you put the font to clear. They call it white words. And so you've got this word, you know, human resource manager, human resource manager, human resource manager in there a million times, and, you know, all the key words. But you can't see it when you read it. But it's like, oh, my God, it's got so many hits, it'll get bopped to the top. And that's not going to work. The system looks for that. The systems have been modernized to know that people do that. And then they'll just bump you because you're cheating. Yes? Is a keywords list accept, acceptable in the, in the qualification summary? Yeah, but you're not going to do it as a list. You, you kind of work it into your qualifications. Okay. It, it needs to be in the natural flow of, the, okay. of that. Yes? If it's okay to repeat at the top of your, your summary and you have bullets of your accomplishments. Yes. To use that underneath the specific job, you might not want to repeat it exactly, right? I mean, you wouldn't want to just take the same one and accomplishment and put it. You can do either one. You can reword it, or you can put it under there so that they know exactly where that one that you mentioned at the top, which job it fell under. You could do it either way. You could do it either way. And remember, you just want to sprinkle those keywords. You don't want to have them so inundated that it looks like you're like, oh my god, I've got to get all this in here. It needs to look legitimate, realistic. Does that make sense? Yes? So on that keywords, you, you sort of indicated um, you can't put too many, but you want enough. So is there a magic number of occurrences you're supposed to have, a magic number of keywords? I mean, what's, what's the rule? There, there isn't, it's just, there needs to be enough that it makes sense. You need to have it in there. One of the things you can do is look at the job posting, see how many times something's mentioned. If it seems to be very prevalent, predominant, make sure you've got it in there a prevalent number of times, and I don't know what that would be depending on the job. One of the things that's suggested is go to the company website and see what is important to the company as well. Um, for example, if it's a company that seems to be concerned about the environment, they have folks that volunteer for environmental causes. And if you happen to um, volunteer and do environmental things, you can also throw in some things that tie into that. So you can get in some keywords that aren't necessarily listed in that job, but that tie into the company. You know, look at, you should always be researching the company, looking at what their mission statement is, what their, um, you know, company vision is. And if you have some things that tie into that, you can throw that in there as well. So that you've got some other keywords that the company 
robot is going to be tied into that that specific job posting may not necessarily have, but they've got overall for a company that will still spark the robot. Does that make sense? So maybe, because normally we don't, you know, volunteer um, activities aren't something that would necessarily pop up, but if they tie into the company's goals and missions, then you want to put that in there as well. Um, yes? So are you saying that the robots that are searching, they, they're not programmed to just look for the keywords from the job posting? They're looking for all of those kind of contextual things as well? It's what I've read. Now, I've not set one up, but I've read that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So that's just one little extra note. Um, anything else? Okay. So, the main thing here to note is that the most effective way to optimize your resume is to bypass the ATS altogether and get into the hands of a human. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about that. I'm sure you've talked about that. We talk about that at the Higher Texas Job Club all the time when, when we do the sessions on, on resumes. If you know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody, even that, to get it into the hands of a human. If you don't know the right human to get it into their hands, friends, coworkers, ex-co-workers, LinkedIn, uh, Spoke.com, um, the company's website, Hoover's database, um, what's that one, Re uh, ReferenceUSA.com, as you can get at the libraries. There are lots of different places that you can go to look up and find out who's who at that company. Yes? Um, does anyone ever accept written mail, snail mail, uh, resumes? Yes. Some do. And I will tell you, as an HR person, um, to be honest with you, it would drive me totally crazy when I've got resumes coming to me that I'm screening based on very specific criteria, and somebody would come waltzing into my office and go, oh my God, Linda, you have got to interview this person. They're fantastic. And it's somebody that I had already gotten the resume from, and I might have screened them out for a particular reason. But they had also sent it to the director of marketing because it's a marketing job. And the director of marketing looked at it and they were like, I need to interview them. And I'm like, well, you know, they weren't in the top because I rated them A, B, C. Um, a is definitely interview, B is maybe, and C is no. And I was like, well, I had them in my B pile. And they're like, oh, no, 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 you've got to interview. It works. It totally works. Some companies, maybe not so much, but. If somebody brought me a resume and said, I got this and I, I'm really well, interested in it. be mailed to you as the person that handles yeah. that particular job? It, I will read it. I promise you, I will read it. I personally do. But I, I'm kind of the human resource person that keeps the human in human resources. So, But I, I, I read it. Yes. Well, and I would assume if it's coming from a subject matter expert for the, for the position you're hired for, you would trust their judgment over yours because they have the qualifications. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. But the main point is if you can get your resume in the hands of a human, you have a much greater chance than getting it through the ATS system. The other thing is, is if you are able to talk to somebody, follow up with them. The number of people that are in hiring positions or in HR that say they never hear from somebody after they get a resume is astounding. The number of people that say, oh, I heard from this person, and because I heard from them, I talked to them, I get a little more information, I'm now going to interview them. Your chances of getting an interview increase exponentially if you actually speak with the person and say, hey, just want to make sure you got my resume. Nine times out of ten, I will actually go and physically see that I get their resume. If it was mailed in particular, I will go look and physically find it and put it on the top of my darn stack because I'm not going to lie to them and say I got it if I didn't get it. And do they usually call back if you need your name and number, for example? I do. I don't know that they all do. I do. Recruiters are a, a little different story. Recruiters are really busy and their goal is to get you a job. Their goal is to fill the jobs that they have open. And so you might get a good recruiter that does. Not all do because recruiters are kind of a, um, they have a difficult job and they're always trying to fill, 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 fill. And their, their loyalty is to the person whose jobs they're trying to fill, not towards the applicants, quite honestly. 
Yeah. I was going to say, rather than spoke, um, I find crunchface.com. Crunchface? Yeah, dot com would be a really good site to look up a company. Oh, okay. good. I haven't heard of that one. Capital backing is, how many people work there, and give you a lot of current press, and as well as the officers of the company and stuff like that. So. Fantastic. Everybody hear that? Crunchface.com? And look up company info? I hadn't heard of that one. Thank you so much. Excellent. All right. Anything else? So the goal is to get that job interview. And so hopefully some of this is a little bit um, helpful. The, there's a really good article that I pulled a lot of this information from. I scanned a lot of them, but this one was that she seemed to have probably the most information. This, this particular article was from March of 2015 um, by Pamela Skillings, S-K-I-L-L-I-N-G-S. And it's how to get the applicant tracking system to pick your resume. And it's, it's actually a very lengthy article. There were a number of them that I used along with just personal knowledge and talking to folks. But um, the whole goal is to get an interview. And you've got to have the right resume, either in person or get it through the HTS system. And um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, would you suggest having two resumes, a text resume and a formatted resume? The text resume to go into the system and the uh, formatted resume to pick to your interview? I think that that's not a bad idea, to be honest with you. I know I, I had multiple resumes, and I always had one that I knew that I was going to take to an interview. And when you go to an interview, it's always good to have one with you. I, I remember going to an interview once, and the person interviewing me, her office was just, this was years ago, an unbelievable mess. And she was searching all over her desk, all over everything. And I finally, after a moment or two, said, it, are, are you by any chance looking for my resume? She goes, yes. I said, would it help if I brought copies? She goes, oh my gosh, yes, that'd be great. And so I gave her a copy of resumes that I brought with me, and she interviewed me. And she was a horrible interviewer. She was the director of HR, and I was applying for a manager job at the time. And it was a horrible interview. That through the whole interview, she kept going, well, and the job does this and this and this. And oh my god, it is so hard. And it does this and this and this, and you have to do this. And it's just so hard. <laughs> and we, it was at a hospital. And we have to hire radio, you know, x-ray technicians, whatever. And they, and they quit all the time. And it was just so hard. And she just kept talking. She wasn't really asking me very many questions. And then at the end, she's like, so are you interested in the job? And I just wanted to say no, because it just sounds so hard. <laughs> <laughs> but she talked, her, she talked me out of the job. So at the end, I said, you know, I just don't think I'm the right person for this job. But thank you so much for your time. And I left, because she talked me out of the job. Have you ever found that way? It, it, well, she was the director. She was hiring for the manager, but she just whined through the whole interview. <laughs> Why would I want to work for you? Have you, no. ever, have you ever found that when you're not interested, they want you more? Yes. It's like dating. Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe, maybe that's the key to interview, and you go in and you act like you're not interested.